This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Macro Voices episode 145 was recorded on December 13th, 2018. I'm Eric Townsend. We have a Macro Voices double header lined up for you this week. NYU Stern School professor Edward Altman's work focuses on subject matter near and dear to my heart, high yield credit. Professor Altman will join me as this week's first feature interview guest. Then, in lieu of our usual post-game segment, we'll have an extended post-game where we're bringing back Louis Vincent Gav to talk about recent volatility in markets and in China relations. I'll also ask Louis what he plans to discuss in his presentation at Macro Voices Live in Vancouver on January 19th. By the way, folks, the early bird pricing for Macro Voices Live ends this Saturday. So if you haven't bought your tickets for January 19th in Vancouver yet, be sure to buy them before the price goes up on Saturday at midnight. And I'm Patrick Ceresna. Now, Eric, let's talk the S&P 500. We printed down to the just under 2,600 on the S&P, and most of the week has been the, about the S&P trying to muster up a bounce or a rally off of those lows. But here we are, three, four days of trading, and the S&P cannot follow through on anything. What's your feeling here? Is, is this looking still bearish to you? Well, let's go back a little bit to the bigger picture, Patrick. We've had two very interesting opportunistic Sunday openings in the futures market. Last week, what we had was that bounce off of the G20 to where in the Sunday evening session, and remember, folks, futures open at 6 p.m. on Sunday, and the S&P index really starts trading then. We got all the way up to whatever it was, 2812 or something, well above 2800. There was your Sunday evening shorting opportunity, and I know your big picture trading listeners knew how to take advantage of that because you'd been writing about it. This Sunday, it was the other end. We were below 2,600, and clearly it was if you're going to buy the dip, this is the moment to buy the dip, and it looked for the first couple of days like buying the dip was the right thing. But as you say, look at where we are. We're at 2,645 as we're speaking a little bit uh, about an hour before the close on uh, Thursday afternoon. So we're taping a little bit early this week. You know, I really haven't seen the follow through here. And it makes me feel like maybe we're still in dead cat bounce mode. Well, but let's go back to that bigger picture of, wow, two Sundays in a row. One, you're, you know, this incredibly opportunistic sell at a really high number. A week later, you're in an opportunistic buy at a really low number. That's really big volatility swings. When's the last time you had that kind of volatility swing? That's what tends to occur before really big moves. The summer of 1987 was like that. You had really big, sudden volatility swings in both directions. So I don't know if it's over yet, but I'm getting more and more concerned that if this breaks to the downside and doesn't hold the way it did Sunday evening into Monday morning, and we don't get that by the dip recovery, uh, I, I think we could be in really big trouble if it gets going to the downside. Even Charlie McElligot, who has been really prescient in calling this market in his daily letter, had thought at the beginning of the week, like, okay, we've got to set up for a really big rip higher. Started that way, but we haven't seen the follow through. So the headlines are going to dictate the action. Obviously, what's going on with Trump and China and so forth could throw the market in either direction. But I'm really getting concerned about the size of these volatility swings and what could be coming in weeks ahead. All right, let's move on to the U.S. dollar because we now have had three attempts for the dollar to kind of push up to the 97.50 level on the uh, continuous contract. And each time the dollar bumps its head and can't break out, but there's literally no selling pressure whatsoever. The dollar just keeps gravitating to the top end of the range, but yet hasn't broken out. Do you think that breakout is going to happen here? Well, I do still favor that, but I'm looking at this chart and it feels to me like, you know, there's a lot of signs that maybe we're just going to be in a consolidation range for a while. 
And I think that if you look at the argument for the dollar higher, it's still in place. But the big question mark that's been cast over it is, hey, if this dovish pivot is really happening, you know, back when Keith McCullough told us that the Fed would hike for the last time in December and there would be no more hikes in 2019, that was a very, very uncommon view. Very few people thought that. Now, a lot more people. I think just in uh, an interview that we'll have linked in the research roundup email, Paul Tudor Jones was talking about no hikes whatsoever in 2019. So if we're really at the point where the Fed is going to pause and stop hiking, that changes the outlook. Now, I think the liquidity squeeze argument that Jeff Snyder has talked about is still there. I'm anxious to hear what he has to say next month in Vancouver about that. But as far as what most people look at in terms of dollar strength and where a lot of the speculators are placing their bets from, it's the expectations around the hiking cycle continuing. If those expectations are fading, we should expect at least a pause here. Now, the reason I do feel in general that this chart is still pretty strong is so many people have come around to that view. The euro dollar futures spreads, which we had charts of on last week's program, are showing us that the market is discounting collapsing expectations around future rate hikes. Yet the dollar's not crashing. It's still holding its own, still above 97 as we're speaking on Thursday afternoon. So it feels to me like this market is really resilient. It hasn't gone down when there was plenty of news that could have let it down, but it's not ready to break higher yet. And uh, I also observe, you know, there have been plenty of times where we just went in a consolidation pattern that was about one and a half big handles wide on the dollar index, and that seems to be how wide it is here, and maybe we're headed into that same thing again. So we'll see how long it lasts. I'm still leaning toward the upside resolution to this, but I'll admit that my conviction is starting to weaken as I see more and more people really predicting that this Fed rate hiking cycle is over or about to end this month. Let's move on to crude oil, because in my mind, it was long overdue for a dead cap bounce, but uh, there has been no bounce. We basically hit that $50 level on the downside, and we have now are pinned basically just a few dollars above that $50 handle. First of all, how did the inventory numbers come out, and what's your take here on the price action? Well, I'll start with inventory. Crude oil drawing down 1.2 million barrels. So it is a drawdown, which in theory would be bullish. The thing is, a lot of people expected a much bigger drawdown. Consensus was a 3.5 million barrel drawdown. API had reported a a gigantic drawdown. That had really got people's expectations. So when it came in at 1.2, it was actually kind of a sigh of relief. Cushing, Oklahoma, building 1.2 million barrels. Uh, Gasoline, building 2 million barrels. Distillates, drawing down 1.5 million barrels. But remember, last week was 3.8 million barrels on the build side. So we're drawing down less than half of last week's build. So I discount that a little bit. Production was down 100,000 barrels. But remember, 100,000 barrels is not really 100,000 barrels. They round to the nearest 100. So production is down by one tick. When you remember that in a very short period of a couple of weeks, it moved up half a million barrels, 400,000 in one week and then 100,000 in the next week. I would have expected a bigger retracement than that. So I don't look at this 100 downtick as a big deal by any stretch of the imagination. Meanwhile, exports, 2.3 million barrels. That equates to 16 million barrels on the week. So we would have had a 15 million barrel build on inventory if not for exports. And something I've noticed, Patrick, in the news, I, I see a lot of news articles saying, okay, crude oil is easing up on China trade tensions finally starting to maybe appear to be getting resolved. Well, keep in mind that if China trade tensions are resolved. True, from an economic standpoint, that's going to be a boost for the stock market. But when I think about crude oil, Patrick, if China trade tensions are resolved, that means China is going to go back to importing a whole lot of U.S. crude oil, drawing down U.S. inventories, and that's going to have probably a bullish effect, at least on WTI, perhaps not on Brent. So I think the market is maybe not discounting this, at least the same way that I see it. But as far as the big picture, I want to go back to what I said last week, which is 
everybody was waiting for OPEC to cut and then for this massive V-shaped recovery. And what I said to expect is figure if, if there's a cut, there's going to be a bounce. It probably won't last very long. And then we head back down and maybe test the lows. Well, we haven't quite tested the uh, 49 and a half low that we had last week, but we got awful close to it this morning. We got down to uh, less than 50 spot 50. So we're seeing lower and lower numbers. Is that going to last? I'm not sure, but I won't be surprised. As I said last week, I think Mohammed bin Salman wants to stabilize the market so it doesn't crash from here. The good news is we've eliminated that outlier risk. The the idea of there being no cut in a $10 crash in price, it's off the table. They cut 1.2 million barrels. That's going to stabilize the market. I think we probably stay in a sideways consolidation range down here around 50 bucks. And I won't be surprised if there's worsening economic data if we start to see a move back down toward the mid to high 40s. I don't think it's at all out of the question to see that. Now, at some point, we're going to move much higher in price. But it seems to me like for now, the market is really seeing that there's not a lot of uh, willingness on Saudi Arabia's part to be aggressive about trying to support the market. And even in the face of that cut, we're not seeing that big V-shaped recovery. So I think we consolidate in approximately the range that we're in without any really big moves to the upside right away, maybe moving a little bit more to the downside before this is over. Eric, let's talk gold because it broke out. For the last two weeks, gold has broken to multi-month highs, but it doesn't seem to have any mojo. It doesn't seem to have any real gusto behind the move. It, we kind of burst higher to just over 1250, and now we're sort of pinned in this range. Do you think this uh, rally is going to stick here in gold? Are we going higher from here? You know, I am perplexed by it. And as you said, for a while, what we were really seeing is even on days that the dollar was strong, gold was strong on the same day. And that was really an indication to me that maybe we're, we're moving into a regime where gold is going to trade like it's supposed to as a safe haven asset. And uh, there's certainly enough problems in the world for a safe haven asset to move higher. Lately, we've been kind of trading off and, and, you know, you've seen a lot of signals that we're breaking out of that regime of just inverse trading with the U.S. dollar. But even as we saw signals that you and I both thought would have caused technicians to say, hey, buy this breakout, you know, we should have propelled it higher. Never really got there. Meanwhile, Charlie McGilligot's numbers have moved up even again since last week. That number that we at one point had been 1245 is now 1286. And Nomura's CTA model now shows gold positioning as neutral. It would move to 32% long on a daily close above 1286, and then it would go to max long on a daily close over 1300. On the other hand, it would go to max short on a daily close below 1198. And of course, we're well above 1198, almost uh, $50 above it. But you know, a $50 move in gold, depending on what's happening, is not out of the question. So I'm really curious to see if the dollar does break higher above 97.5, whether gold takes it in the chin or not. And uh, I'm, I'm waiting to see what happens here. I want to believe in gold. I think that gold is going to have a really really big move up, but especially if I'm right that the dollar rally is not over, there may be a little wave down before that happens. Eventually, we'll get to much higher gold prices, but I'm not sure if it's time yet. So let's talk the 10-year treasury yields because we were just at three and a quarter a month ago, and suddenly this current drop, we found ourselves right at the summer lows trading right near the 280 on the bottom level of this range. What a huge change of interest rates, but is this going to stick? We're getting a little bit of a bounce. Do you think we're still going lower on yields from here? We could be. You know, as we've said on this program several times, two spot 80 and two spot 60 are very significant technical support levels on the 10 year yield. So to move down to 280 and bounce 10 or 12 basis points before maybe rolling over and going further down would be entirely consistent with a normal chart pattern. Nothing goes up or down in a, in a straight line. I think it really remains to be seen, though. What I'm noticing when Keith McCullough nailed this call on this program a few weeks ago, nobody else was saying that there was going to be no further rate hikes in 2019. I shouldn't say nobody else, but that was an extremely unpopular view. 
more and more big names are coming around to that view. And, of course, as those guys come around to that view, it influences a lot of other decision makers on the street. So it brings into question this whole same thing I said in the dollar index. It's the question of the dovish pivot. Are we really done hiking? And if the economic news continues to get worse, and of course the whole China trade situation casts a looming shadow all over everything in the markets. But I think lower yields are entirely possible. And remember, even uber bear Julian Brigden, who is extremely bearish on a secular basis in the long term, said, look, we got plenty of room to go all the way back to 2% on on the U.S. 10-year without breaking the longer-term bearish trend that he sees. So we, we may be looking at a significant counter-trend rally that's to the upside in price, to the downside in yield. Well, thanks for the market update, Eric. Now, this week's featured interview guest is Professor Edward Altman from the NYU Stern School of Business. Eric's interview with Professor Altman is coming up as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. And now with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager, Eric Townsend. Joining me next on the program is Professor Edward Altman from the NYU Stern School of Business. Dr. Altman is perhaps best known for the Z-score measure of credit, which we'll discuss in this interview. Before we get started, though, Dr. Altman provided a fantastic slide deck. Listeners, you'll find the link to that slide deck in your research roundup email. If you're not yet registered, just go to macrovoices.com. Look for the red button next to Dr. Altman's picture that says, looking for the downloads. Dr. Altman, I'd like to start with the really big picture. So many people in finance have said, okay, that's it. The secular bull market is over. The secular bear market is on. Once we break three spot 10 on the 10 year, baby, it's all over after that. Yields will never go lower. The market's headed straight down in terms of price. And of course, what we've been seeing in the last several weeks is the exact opposite. So what's going on here? Where are we in the cycle? Are we really at the beginning of a new cycle or the end of an old cycle? And if not, where are we in the cycle? And what are the signs we should be looking for to tell us whether and when it's ending? Yeah, the fact of the matter is that we are not yet out of what is the longest and perhaps most impressive bull market in uh, risky debt of all types ever since the last crisis of 2009. And we are not over that yet. So it's too early to indicate that, in fact, the benign credit cycle is over. Before we even talk about whether it's over and how strong it's been and the like, I think it's very important to define what we mean by a credit cycle and what we mean by a benign cycle or a stressed or a crisis situation. And on the first slide that I have, I point to a number of important variables that I think one should look at. One is the default rate of corporate securities. Now, I've always concentrated on the high yield junk bond market, and so that's the metric I use. And historically, around 3.4% of high yield bonds on average default every year. And of course, the investor doesn't lose that because there's usually a significant recovery if there is a default. But default rates are the first metric I look at. And we are still way below the historic average. This year, finishing up very soon in 2018, the rate should be around 1.5% of default, way below the 34 Uh, rate. So that metric shows we're still in a benign cycle. The second metric is the recovery rate. That is, if there is a default, how much do you recover on it? Historically, around 45 cents on the dollar for corporate bonds and about 65 cents on the dollar for corporate loans. This year, it'll come in at the high 50s, close to 60 percent. And so again, it's an indication of a benign cycle. The third variable is the yield. You mentioned the fact that the government rate now is at 3.1, but in, for risky debt, we measure the so-called risk premium or the uh, yield spread over the government rate, and usually the 10-year rate is the benchmark. And so historically, that's around 5.25% above the government rate for high-yield bonds. And this year, it's uh, up, yes, in the last month or so, given the volatility and the downturn in the stock market and the bond markets, 
it's up to around 4.5%. So still a fair amount below the historic average, indicating we are still in our relatively low yield, low risk environment. And indeed, the government rate is no longer 3.1, but down to about 2.8%. And so we are uh, still in a benign yield situation. And finally, the last variable is liquidity. And liquidity, while definitely has diminished with the volatility of late and the concern about the future from all investors just about in the world, the liquidity is still, however, historically speaking, quite good. And even very low quality companies like triple C bonds are able to raise money fairly easily in the market. So all four variables, defaults, recoveries, yields, and liquidity are all saying we are in the benign cycle. And if you look at the next slide, which shows you the relationship between default rates, that's the line graph, the historical default rates, benign credit cycles, and recession periods in the U.S., the yellow bars, or if you don't have a, a colored TV, so to speak, or whatever monitor you're looking at, the yellow bars represent recession periods. And in the U.S., we're very fortunate to have many recessions. And as a result, we have good measurement, the relationship between defaults and recessions. And you'll notice that in the last three recessions, which are the most relevant ones in terms of the size of leverage finance in our world, the uh, default rates tend to peak just after the recession ends, whether it be in the uh, 1991, 0102, or 0809 period. But notice also they start rising before the recession actually begins. So there's no question in my mind, and maybe this preempts a question you will ask later, that in order for us to have a true crisis situation with escalating default rates in the high yield market of above 10%, we're not going to need a recession. And without that recession, we will not have a crisis situation, I am convinced. But I'm also convinced that we will have a recession. The question is when. And we can get to that in another question. So that, in a nutshell, maybe a little bit big nutshell, is the way I look at the credit cycle. We are in a benign cycle. We are now just about nine years into it, the longest by far now since the modern economic period. It's not likely that we will leave that for at least six to 12 months. Let's talk then about where you see the biggest risks going forward, because a lot of people, myself included, have felt like, hey, everybody's focused on uh, maybe the stock market crashing someday. I-, I think more about credit markets crashing, but I wonder where, you know, is, is, it, is it in high yield? Is it, is it in treasury? So where do you see the biggest risks? What do you see coming? And how would we know when it's time to start worrying about those things? Yeah, those are all great questions and uh, complicated ones. If you look further, and I'm going to go toward the end of the slide deck that I provided at slide number 10, I list the major risks going forward. But these are the risks that if they occur, then a crisis is fairly uh, imminent, as opposed to perhaps some other variables that might point to when we first indicate that there is a, uh, a change in the cycle. By far, from a fundamental standpoint, the biggest risks are uh, global economic performance, primarily in the U.S., China, and to some extent Europe, and their impact on the four variables that I mentioned, defaults, recoveries, credit, availability, and quality of credit. What really then is important to focus on is the fundamental economic activity and performance of the major economies of the world, and that primarily is the U.S. and China. Both now are relatively high growth situations. The U.S. certainly through the third quarter of this year is growing, was growing out of three and a half percent, three percent maybe for the whole year. GDP growth in China has been miraculously averaging six and a half to seven percent for for as long as anybody can remember. Both of those are likely to end very soon. The question is, will they be hard landings or soft landings in terms of how much they will settle down into? So I look to a number of the um, so-called macroeconomic pundits, 
And they're pretty much in, I wouldn't say all in agreement, but a lot of them are in fairly strong agreement that the downturn in the U.S. economy is likely to happen in 2020, and it could result in a recession either then or soon thereafter. I would say certainly more than 50% of the economists that I've read or talked to. In China, I think everyone now pretty much agrees that their growth rate will not for 2018 be 6.5% or or above, and that it will fall, and the question is how much below that, and then what will happen soon and thereafter. What's causing these um, fairly pessimistic scenarios? Well, in the case of the U.S., that the biggest stimulus to growth in the last uh, two quarters has clearly been the uh, tax break that the Trump administration put through, and um, that's just about finished with some residual benefits, but a lot of that tax benefit did not result in increased productivity. The money wasn't reinvested. It was either paid out in the form of um, dividends, which is nice for short-term consumer growth, or it was used to buy back stock of companies, which doesn't do anything for the productivity of the economy. And so as a result, That influence is now almost finished. That could drop GDP a couple of percent right there. The trade wars are certainly not doing any good to the growth rate, even though some small number of uh, producers will benefit. And um, in China, there's no question that the low-cost Chinese goods are now being duplicated in other countries. The Chinese are very worried about the huge growth in debt in their economy, and so they're putting the clamps on the debt very appropriately, by the way, and that has to be a negative on growth. And so if it comes in at five and a half or five and three quarters for China, and even lower in years to come, which wouldn't be a surprise, that will be a real, real hit in the stomach to a number of countries that uh, trade a good deal with China. And I'm thinking in Europe of Germany, and uh, Japan, a number of other countries whose uh, dependence on Chinese growth has been a strong stimulus for their own growth. So um, that is uh, the biggest one for me, that global economic performance. India now is showing some weaknesses too, especially in the news today about their conflict between the administration there and the central bank and the um, the need to put a clamp also on the growth of debt in the economy because of the high non-performing loans in their banking system. Europe is back to having problems again. Brexit isn't helping. So there, there's very little optimism now. And what that all means, of course, is potentially its impact not only on themselves, but on the emerging markets, which is not good. Falling oil prices, I didn't think there was much chance that we would fall back to $50 a barrel a few months ago. (laughs) And here we are. We're back to $50 a barrel. Anything lower than that, that's going to trigger a resurgence in defaults in the uh, energy industry, particularly uh, fossil fuel and, and natural gas following that. So it's not good, that relationship. And I think that's going to be a problem. For me, and I want to come back to this later, Eric, when we uh, have time, I want to emphasize the most consequential impact of the next downturn in defaults in uh, the credit cycle. And that is, this time, the global debt situation is so much larger than ever before, the consequences could be really dire. And I have some graphs to show you that as well. Finally, among the five bullets that I'm going to mention, and there are some others as well, I look at my Z-score model, and what is that telling us about the credit quality of corporate America, and whether or not it's different than it was in 2007, which was just before the crisis. So in terms of major risk going forward, I think you can look at that slide, and you can probably see that there are lots of them, and some are technical, some are fundamental, and some are based on what could happen. But the outlook if we do have a downturn, is going to be pretty serious because of the incredible buildup in global debt. Here I'm emphasizing global, not just the U.S. So hopefully that covers the uh, major risk going forward.
I should mention, the very bottom, <laughs> there's always the risk of something, or in this case, the uncertainty of something that we didn't know about, we didn't think about, but happens, something geopolitical, not only a moderate, but a huge trade war, protectionism, etc. something that's hard to put a probability on, but when it happens, it usually turns things very quickly. And the one variable of my list of credit cycle indicators that changes the fastest and one that uh, you'll know it very quickly when it happens is liquidity. That can literally dry up when somebody turns off the faucet and you know that doesn't take very much time. We can pursue any one of those if you'd like, but I do want to get back to the global debt excess and combining that with uh, interest rates. I definitely want to come back to that one because it's near and dear to my heart. But before we go there, let's just spend a quick minute on your Z-score model. A lot of our listeners are already familiar with it, but for those who are not, give us just the very quick overview. What is Z-score? What does it tell you? Well, it's a model I built 50 years ago, and uh, I'm as surprised as anyone that it's still around, and, and not only around, but it's still actually used more than ever before. It's a model that looks at the basic performance attributes of companies from their financial data, balance sheets, income statements, cash flows, and the like, looks at five financial indicators. Some of them are were new at the time, but none of them are exceedingly uh, unusual, looking at liquidity aspects, profitability, solvency, leverage, and activity. Those are the five measures, each one represented in a financial ratio from the most recent balance sheet or income statement of a company. And then based on the statistical programs that I've run back when I was a graduate student at UCLA, and you're very flattering to say that it was when I was a young man. Yes, I was seven years old then, and uh, but seriously, I wasn't that old. I was old enough to know that I needed some support from mainframe computers, which just started then and from statistical programs, which were now available on mainframes, to use those algorithms to come up with a weighting system of those five variables. The technique is a statistical discriminant analysis technique, which gives the weightings, and those weightings are determined by the computer program, not by me, to achieve the highest accuracy in predicting bankruptcy within two years. And those five variables weighted appropriately have been for 50 years now, three reasons why they're still around. First, it's really simple. You don't have to be a statistical guru or a uh, math genius to understand it and to uh, interpret it. Second, it's been pretty accurate. I'd say 80 to 90% accuracy within two years of the bankruptcy to predict it accurately. And three, it's free. You don't have to pay for it. Acting with uh, a large number of studies that use it as a benchmark, in other words, it's easy to replicate and compare with new models, has really jettisoned it into prominence, not only among you know, individuals and uh, banks and the like, but also to be used for a large variety of purposes. And it's the standard measure, prototype, if you will, for banks and other regulated institutions to use in estimating their probability of default and loss given default of their counterparties, which is critical for their capital allocations under the Basel regulatory framework. So those variables and its background have been the reason why it's still around, why it's thriving. And indeed, I used it to compare the profile of corporate America back in 2007, just before the crisis, and today, and to see whether or not the credit worthiness of U.S. companies have improved or not. The bottom line from that, and there's a chart that your readers can look at more carefully when you had time, it's slide number nine in the slide deck, if we look at 07 versus 17, we see that the average and median Z score has actually improved, but very, very little. And statistically, I think most statisticians would conclude 
that it's statistically and significantly different than it was in 07, which means that even though uh, companies are more profitable and they have uh, more liquidity and there's all sorts of mechanisms today that weren't around 10 years ago to keep them out of the bankruptcy courts, still their fundamental credit profiles are about the same as they were in 07. And in my mind, that's bad news because 07 was right before the crisis. So what do we need? Z-score is telling us that we need to not go into a recession because that's what happened in 08, 09. But interestingly enough, that recession was caused mainly by the financial markets. That wasn't caused by fundamental growth problems in the economy. If you add to the picture a negative economic fundamental scenario, then you've got the possibility that we could go into that recession or downturn significantly in a very short period of time. So that's a little bit of the background on the Z-score. Let's come back to that subject of the impact of just how much debt we have when we do get into trouble here. Because on one hand, you're preaching to the choir. I couldn't agree more. We've got so much debt in the world now, even negative yielding sovereign debt. 20 years ago, you told somebody there was going to be negative yielding sovereign debt. They would have thought you were crazy. But here's the thing, Professor, that, that hangs me up. When Ross Perot told us in 1992 Five trillion dollars of federal debt is unsustainable. You know, he was right. His argument made sense. But somehow they keep getting away with this. So how is it possible that we keep amassing more and more debt without anything breaking? And why is it that we should be concerned, particularly now at this juncture, that maybe it's going to be different? The timing of this is also very tricky, Eric. And uh Let's first talk about the level of debt that we're talking about. And Ross Perot's five trillion is uh, really tiny compared to what we're talking about today. If you look at slide five, it shows the um, investment grade and bond investment grade corporate sector in the U.S. The leverage in the system, just the bonds outstanding, not even the loans. And you'll see the incredible growth since 2007 in uh, investment grade debt mainly uh, the so-called triple Bs. Then there's the growth in the high yield or junk bond area from about $1 trillion in 07 to $1.7 trillion in uh, 2018. And so we're talking about over $9 trillion just in corporate bonds. If you add loans to that, you're probably doubling it or close to that, and certainly in our leveraged loan sector, which is the equivalent to high yield for lending for loan markets, we're talking about even more growth. So we're talking about more than doubling of growth in 10 years. When we had the last recession, we had so many problems. And that's just non-financial corporate debt in the U.S. If you then look at slide six, the next slide, and you take a look at something which very few people evaluate, but I look at it very carefully. And that is the, I don't know if the readers have it in color or not, but the solid line, the blue line on my graph, represents non-financial corporate debt as a percentage of GDP. So it's like debt to cash flow for an economy, in this case, the U.S. And that, you notice, has had three peaks around the last three crisis periods. We had 1991, we had 0102, and 0809. The dotted line, or the red line, dotted line if you have in color, is the time series of default rates in the high yield sector. And that has had three peaks within 12 months of the peak of the debt level in the last three recession cycles. So is it just by chance that default rates peak after a peak in debt? Well, I don't think it's by chance at all. It shows the relationship between the growth in debt and the growth in defaults, combined with the catalyst being the economic cycle. Now, look at the current situation, and you find that the level of non-financial corporate debt as a percentage of GDP is at a new peak, and the highest it's ever been, at more than 46% of GDP. But down at the bottom, you see the default rate is still very low under the historic average by far. The one blip up in recent years was 2016 when we had the oil default crisis. 
that was specific to the U.S. and the shale industry, but could happen again and could spread to other countries as well if the price of oil continues its downward trend. Now, the question is, of course, this red line, if and when that will rise, and I'm sure it will if we have a recession, and then the question is what will be the impact and the consequence, and look at that level of non-financial corporate debt as a percentage of GDP, it's at an all-time high. So like your concerns with this, I have the concern, but now I've got the evidence to show what happens when things turn in the credit cycle. The next slide, if I may, let's go to the global situation, not just the U.S. And that shows four main sectors of any economy, non-financial corporates, government, the financial sector, and household. Those four together amount to an economy's total debt. And if you add up all the economies of the world, you get global debt. And in three of the four cases, non-financial corporates, government, and household, we've had an incredible increase in 20 years, actually in all four sectors in 20 years, and in 10 years, the last 10 years, non-financial corporate debt has gone from, as a percentage of GDP, has gone from 77% to 92. That means 92% of the GDP of the world is the level of non-financial corporate debt. Now, you asked the question before, why have all this debt in the past not caused the crisis? We've always been able to come out of it. Well, that's true. We have, and it was mainly the incredible liquidity pumping by the central banks of the world that has done it several times. And the question is, can they do it again? And the other thing is they did it to curb usually one of these four sectors problems. It was the household debt back in 07, 08, followed by the corporate sector in 09. Okay, now we've got government debt going from 58% of GDP globally in 20 years ago to 58%. No change in government debt, at least in terms of percentage of GDP in those 10 years. But now it's gone to 87%. Incredible increases to finance, among other things, trade deficits, lower taxes, and generally poor economic activity. And so government debt has skyrocketed. Financial debt had its big growth between 20 and 10 years ago. It's actually lower as a percentage of GDP now as the banks of the world have had to refinance and add equity to their capital structures in the wake of their crisis. But still, it's at a pretty high level of 80%. And household debt has gone from 42 to 59%. Not so much a problem in the U.S. The government seems to have that under control at this point, and that's a good thing. But in many other countries, it's the number one problem that the central banks point to. I visited Scandinavia last year, and uh, it, it, by far, they're worried about a replication of what happened in the U.S., replica of what happened in the U.S. 10 years ago. And now they're looking at their own situation and saying it's getting out of hand, as is in some other countries as well. Put it all together, we are about 100 percentile, not 100 percent, but 100 percent percentages higher in debt to GDP than we were 20 years ago and 50 percentage points higher than 10 years ago. Put it all together. My conclusion of this is twofold. One, yes, a lot of debt. So if we have a downturn, a lot more defaults. I think that's pretty clear in almost all sectors. But interestingly enough, and this I don't have the exact data on because it's not necessarily easy to know this, but my opinion is that a good deal of the growth in GDP in the last 10 years, and we've seen it in a number of countries in the world, both in Asia and now in the U.S., has been on the backs of low-cost debt. In other words, countries and companies have been able to finance their growth with very low-cost debt. You mentioned negative debt, negative interest rates before, at least in Europe and close to that in the U.S. That's been you know, the catalyst to growth. And now with that growth in debt likely to go away, because of the fear 
of the debt buildup being too high in countries like China and other countries, including the U.S. probably, there won't be that low-cost debt, especially if interest rates rise. But even if they stay the same with the governments clamping down on the growth of debt in the fear that this could be you know, the biggest problem if we have a downturn again. So I'm pretty convinced that a lot of that growth is, you know, you don't have to grow very much in terms of cash flows, uh, GDP, et cetera, if you have uh, a very low interest rate to pay on the bulk of the financing you use for that growth. And we haven't seen the big growth coming from productivity, at least not of late. So um, that is, uh, in a nutshell, my concern with the level of debt and the cost of the debt over the last 20 years and where we are today. Dr. Altman, I can't thank you enough for a fantastic interview. Before I let you go, though, you have a fourth edition of one of your books coming out from Wiley Finance in March. Tell us a little bit about what's new and what they can expect there. Well, thanks for asking. Yeah, 100 years ago, I did the first edition. Just kidding, but it, it is a long time ago. Of Corporate Financial Distress and Bankruptcy, a uh, John Wiley publication. And uh, every 10, 15 years, I decide it's time to uh, redo it and come out with a new edition. And with two great colleagues, Edith Hotchkiss and Wei Wang, we are now just finished and put to bed the fourth edition. Should be out in March 2019 of now, it's a somewhat expanded title, Corporate Financial Distress, Restructurings and Bankruptcies. It really brings up to date a large amount of data, information, theory, et cetera, that has come on the scene ever since the third edition, which was in 2006. So looking forward to that, and hopefully some of your readers will be interested in uh, looking at it as well. All right. Well, thanks so much. We really appreciate an excellent interview. Patrick Ceresna and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right here at macrovoices.com. Macro Voices is a listener-driven program. Please email requests for specific future interview guests to requests at macrovoices.com. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com, and we'll answer them on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. We also welcome your suggestions for how we can improve the program. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, what a great interview with Professor Altman. It was so interesting to get his insights in terms of where we are in that cycle. Now, joining us here in the post game is Louis Vincent Gav. How are you doing, Louis? Very well, thank you. How are you? I'm doing great. So we wanted to continue the conversation because you just wrote a piece and published it out, and all of our listeners can find that in the Research Roundup email titled, An Important Crossroad. And when I was looking at this, you immediately caught my attention on page eight. It's titled, The Fish Have Emerged, But Where Is the Whale? Why don't you explain to us uh, what you mean by this? Sure. Sure. One of the oldest Gafkel analogies that, frankly, we've uh, bored our listeners to tears with is uh, the analogy of a liquidity squeeze as dynamite fishing. Now, I'll assume that most of your listeners don't go dynamite fishing every weekend. But basically, when you do, when you sort of stick a dynamite in the sea, what ends up happening is the little fish die first and they pop up to the surface. And what you don't know is that below the surface, the sharks and the whales are also dead. But they take weeks before they show up dead at the surface, hence the fairly gruesome picture that you see on, on page eight. For me, the question today, I, I do believe we've been in a liquidity squeeze all year, a liquidity squeeze, squeeze triggered by the timing of the Fed, by the up until recently high oil prices, and by runaway U.S. budget deficits that uh, take out a lot of free capital from, uh, from everywhere in the world. And that uh, as this liquidity squeeze has unfolded, we've seen... Argentina hit the wall or show up to the surface. We've seen Turkey. We've seen problems in emerging markets. We've seen the crypto space implode. And these would all qualify as little fish. And, you know, of course, for people invested there, these re represent real losses. But for the whole economic system, these are hits that the economic system can take on and, and keep going. Argentina blowing up is, you know, neither here nor there for the men on the street in America or the men on the street in Europe. And the question, of course, is, will a whale show up? And the whale, you know it's a whale 
when it basically triggers a change in policy, change in policy from the Fed or a change in fiscal policy or a change in regulatory policies. And you know, to stay with the analogy, if you go back to 2008, you might have thought Bear Stearns was the whale in 2008. Turns out it wasn't. And really, I think AIG was really the big whale that triggered a massive shift in policies, you know, the unleashing of TARP and uh, zero interest rates everywhere, et cetera. So today we've been in a liquidity squeeze, but you really haven't seen yet a change of policies from either central bankers or, uh, or, or ministries of finances around the world. And maybe we won't. You know, sometimes the system works through the liquidity squeezes, or maybe we still have the whale to look forward to. Now, on page nine, you were asking the question, is GE the whale? Is that something that's on your mind? Do you think GE could be a big enough issue? Oh, it, GE would definitely be a big enough issue. I mean, look, first, it's an important cog in the U.S. economy. It employs a lot of people. It's got a massive pension fund. It's hard to imagine the Fed raising interest rates should General Electric face, uh, face bankruptcy. So that, that would be one potential well. But perhaps the biggest reason it would be a well is actually on, on page 10. This G uh, is, of course, one downgrade away from, uh, from being uh, a junk bond. And the big issue, of course, is if G gets downgraded, then that means that the U.S. junk bond market basically grows by 10% overnight, given the amount of outstanding debt that G has. Now, of course, you could have an increase in supply of 10% in uh, junk bonds. It doesn't mean that at the same time you'd have an increase in demand of 10% for, for junk bonds. So if G was downgraded, you'd have a bunch of people that have to sell it because they can no longer hold them because it's past their mandates, and there'd be no buyers on the other side. I mean, basically, the, you know, the junk bond market can grow 10% overnight. Now, for this reason, I actually don't think G will be downgraded. A lot of pressure will be put on the ratings agencies for that not to happen. And a lot of pressure is right now being put on GE for that not to happen. GE is rapidly selling assets and doing everything it can to keep the balance sheet clean enough to remain investment grade. And, you know, logically, this is what should happen. But staying on page 10, and I think this is where perhaps the biggest whale is, it's the broader size of, of the U.S. corporate bond market. Now, indeed, today, thanks in part to very low interest rates, we haven't had any defaults, but we have to acknowledge that you know the total size of the corporate bond market is now more than twice as big as it was in, in 2008. We've had a massive increase in, in U.S. corporate leverage, and this increase, of course, has happened at a time when the U.S. economy was expanding. The global economy was doing fine. The problem today, of course, is the global economy is no longer uh, you know booming on, on all cylinders. China is obviously slowing down. Europe is, is obviously slowing down. And, you know, when you look at the fact that the, uh, the triple B space, basically the, the space that's one downgrade away from being junk is, uh, you know, nearly three trillion U.S. dollars, how is that going to behave in a downturn? How is that going to behave if you, if you start to see downgrades? Well, that part cannot be absorbed by the size of the junk bond market. So you have a potential massive dislocation here between – the potential size of the junk bond market, if you project yourself to the size of what it's going to be in the downturn, and the overall demand for junk bonds. Well, that's interesting because when I look at this chart, back in 2008, the total size of the junk bond market and plus the triple B rated bonds was just about a trillion dollars. Now, just guesstimating here, but we got about a trillion dollar junk bond market and a further three trillion dollars of triple B rated bonds. Now, we don't need a default cycle per se, but rather a downgrade cycle to really cause a problem. The question is, is that of all of these that fall into this fallen angel category and, and potentially are going to get downgraded, is there enough liquidity in your mind in the junk bond space to absorb a downgrade where some you know, 10 or 20 percent of these triple Bs get downgraded during a recession? What would happen under those circumstances in your mind? Well, spreads will completely blow out. Like what you're talking about, you know, if we start a downgrade cycle, the question is, can the junk bond market grow from a trillion to two trillion in a relatively short period of time. Who will be buying that additional trillion of, of junk bonds? It's not obvious to me who, who will be buying that at all. Of course, in a downgrade cycle, people are more inclined to sell than to buy junk bonds. So for me, you know, that's, as I look through the system and think about what the whales are, everybody's got their own theories on, on who the whales are going to be. Some people say, oh, it's going to be Italy. Uh, of course, you could now say with everything that's been unfolding, no, no, it's going to be France. 
A lot of people in the U.S. tend to believe it's going to be China. My big fear is is this. It's the triple B space in, in the United States that has basically grown from roughly half a trillion in 2008 to three trillion today uh, without going through a, a downgrade cycle. Now, you could easily make the point and say, well, look, because it's so big, U.S. policymakers can't afford the downgrade. They can't afford for this, you know, potential doubling of the size in the junk bond market. So, you know, if and when we start getting an inclination of that, the Fed will act very actively and, and preemptively to uh, to make sure that, you know, the show stays on the road. Perhaps even do what uh, we've seen in Europe, which is start buying corporate bonds itself. Uh, of course, you know, the ECB has basically completely prevented price discovery in the, uh, the European corporate bond market. Maybe you can envisage a future where you see the same thing out of the Fed. Louis, I want to pick up on the direction you're going there, because as we look at this massive gray wedge on page 10, $3 trillion of triple B debt, a lot of people have eyed that. We've talked about it on this program. A lot of people have written about it elsewhere. Okay, that's the thing to short is your U.S. triple Bs. But I see at least three things wrong with that. Number one is... There's really no obvious pure play. Most of our listeners don't have the ability to short all of those individual issues. You need some kind of instrument to do it through. And there's really no pure play ETF that's just triple B rated. If there was, frankly, you wouldn't want that because this is a big enough space. What you'd really want would be the ETF that's got all of the risk negative triple Bs. And, you know, that, that doesn't exist any place. If you could find it. The next problem that you just alluded to is this is such a systemic risk for the economy that the Fed might choose to take it in the teeth someplace else in order to prevent the collapse of the triple Bs because it's such a huge risk. And that means that you might get the Fed kind of stepping in between you and that speculative trade you wanted. So if you can't, for all of those reasons, find the pure play to short the greatest risk debt here. How do you play this speculation with instruments that are actually available to trade in the market? I think that's uh, that's a great question. So on your first point on the shorting of ETFs, I recently read an article, I think it was on Bloomberg, about how uh, the uh, the short position on the U.S. corporate bond ETFs keep growing. So obviously this is something that uh, more and more people are, are starting to worry about. And, and indeed, perhaps the simplest and obvious way is to short those corporate bond ETFs. Beyond that, indeed, you know what what can you do? Well, here perhaps you know looking at Europe is uh, is a good example. You know, I think if you looked at the European slowdown of recent years, one obvious conclusion from that slowdown you could have thought was I'm going to short European corporate debt. European corporate debt is going to be a, a place where the slowdown will be felt heavily. And of course, the ECB stepped in and, and bought everything. So people who had that trade on got actually lost a lot of money. The way you you played it in Europe, of course was to bet that German bond yields would basically go down to zero across the curve and that the euro would plummet, which it did because, you know, the euro went from 150 to uh, today's 113. So, and this is a big if. We don't know if it's going to happen, but if, and that's like two ifs, so, you know, it's somewhat illusory, but you could say, okay, if we start seeing problem in the corporate bonds and if the Fed reacts by buying the bond market to, to make sure that, there's no dislocations, then it's hard to see how U.S. Treasury bond yields don't end lower and the U.S. dollar ends up much, much, much lower. Which actually brings me to to slide 12 in the chart book. And one of the things that I've personally been scratching my head about, which is that, you know, if you told me at the beginning of this year that we'd have a renewed Italian crisis, that we'd have a massive emerging market crisis, that the Chinese stock market would be down 30 percent, that Argentina would be down 50, that the U.S. economy would outperform everybody, that the U.S. stock market would outperform everybody by double digits, and so on. Basically, everything we've seen this year, I would have said, you can't own enough U.S. dollars. And sure, the U.S. dollar has gone up this year, and it's been a good year for the U.S. dollar, but it hasn't been a, a tremendous year for the U.S. dollar. The DXY is up 2.5% year on year, which, given everything that's unfolded, is somewhat disappointing. To me, the U.S. dollar looks a little like a stock that's not going up on good news. It had all the wind in its sails, and yet, including the fact that most people, uh, including myself, started the year fairly bearish on the U.S. dollar, and even with all of that, the U.S. dollar then managed to rally massively. And so, you know, I, I look at this, and I think, oh, the U.S. dollar, to me, behaves a little bit 
like a stock that's not going up on good news, which I don't particularly like. Louis, I want to jump all the way forward. Unfortunately, we don't have time for your whole slide deck today. We'll have more time to get into all these details when we see you in Vancouver next month. But let's go ahead to slide 38, where we get into China, because you have operations in China and Hong Kong with GavCal, your company. You also personally have a home close to Vancouver, B.C., where this whole Huawei arrest situation is going down. Now, in the United States, the way the news flow goes is this lady got herself caught in big, big trouble for violating the Iran sanctions. And uh, boy, she, she better watch out because she's in really big trouble. There's no mention in the U.S. news flow of the fact that the United States government has precisely zero authority legally to tell people in China whether or not they're allowed to deal with Iran. Now, they may have defrauded banks trying to cover up doing something that was actually legal. But the fact that they were actually doing something that was legal, according to everyone except for the United States government, seems to get left out of the U.S. news narrative. So my question to you is, since you deal with so many different international investors, how do the investors that you deal with in Asia and elsewhere around the world see this situation and what does it portend in terms of their inclination to both continue to use the U.S. dollar as well as to invest in the United States? Well, um, I think one point I'd make is if I were the CEO today of Boeing or Lockheed Martin or Raytheon selling a lot of weapons to Taiwan, I'd probably stay in the United States for a while uh, until this whole thing gets resolved because, you know, it is – for Chinese law, it is illegal to sell weapons to Taiwan. And so the parallel would be, imagine if you're the CEO of Boeing and you're going to, let's say, Indonesia, and China asks for your extradition from Indonesia because you're selling weapons to Taiwan. And that's more or less a, a parallel here, or at least that's the one that, if you're Chinese, that's what you're thinking today. Um, and so I think the reality the underlying reality behind this is that we've seen a real effort by the United States in recent years to, in essence, extradite all of its laws onto the, to the rest of the world. Basically, the U.S. says, these are our laws, and you guys have to apply them to, to your own countries. And one of the main ways the U.S. has uh, extradited its laws is through the intermediary of the U.S. dollar. And you and I have talked about this before, and we've written a lot about this in our research where the scales fell from our eyes uh, was when BNP, and you know, being French, maybe we're more sensitive to it, when BNP got fined billions of dollars for doing business in Sudan, which was completely legal under French law, uh, and it is a French bank, but the United States said, look, you're doing this business in U.S. dollars, thus we have a right to look at it because the U.S. dollar is the U.S. currency, and any business that anybody does anywhere in the world in U.S. dollars, we get to look into it. And I think that was a, a sort of change of policies from the U.S. because for years, people were doing business in U.S. dollars all over the world, and it, nobody thought that this meant the U.S. Treasury could say, hey, what's going on here? But of course, the fact that now, you know, when you have a two-way deal in U.S. dollars, it's actually a three-way deal because the U.S. dollar, the U.S. Treasury can get to look into it, makes a lot of people uh, uncomfortable. You know, it's... Uh, Making a ménage à trois work is never an easy thing. And most people feel that, you know, when there's three people in a relationship, there's, there's one too many. And so this does put, I think, a, a question mark over the use of the U.S. dollar long term for a lot of people. A lot of people don't want to be in a ménage à trois with the United States when they do business. They find a threesome uncomfortable. And so it creates, uh, I think, a big cloud long term over the use of the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency. Now, China and Russia have been talking for a long time about de-dollarization and trying to persuade other countries to stop using the dollar. That had fallen on deaf ears for quite a few years, and particularly just in the last year or so. We've got Europe really waking up and starting to take China's side. Do you think that the de-dollarization campaign spearheaded by Sergei Glazyev in Russia 
is going to spread to the point where it seriously threatens the U.S. dollar's reserve status and hegemony over the system. And if that were to happen, let's say these people stop using U.S. dollars, do you think the U.S. government is going to be any less likely if they were doing this business? And, you know, let, let's suppose that China had violated the U.S. sanctions in euros in some transaction. Do you think the U.S. would be any less likely to involve itself and to uh, assert its authority to oversee that transaction as well? The second part of the question is, is fascinating to me because when I look at U.S. elections for you know the, the recent years, it seems to me that U.S. voters keep voting for the more isolationist candidate that's on offer. So Trump was obviously much more isolationist than, than Clinton. Obama was more isolationist than either Romney or McCain. Before that, actually, George W. Bush was more isolationist than either Kerry or Gore. The U.S. electorate keeps picking whoever is basically saying, look, let's bring America to our own borders. Let's stop being an empire. Being an empire is too expensive, et cetera. And each time they vote for the more isolationist, uh, each time they get more global intervention. And so it seems that you know, the U.S. population doesn't want the empire, but they get it anyway. And they, they get it pretty much come what may. And so I don't really have any hope that Washington, D.C. will turn around and say, you know what, let's stop weaponizing the U.S. dollar to do our foreign policy goals. I think it's actually going completely the other way. And the more the U.S. does it, the more people are inclined to look to look for alternatives. Now, by any measure, the RMB is a poor alternative. You know, nobody likes the Chinese regime. China doesn't really have friends around the world. It might have a few clients. Uh, it might have people that it bought. But, you know, China doesn't have friends like, like the U.S. historically has had friends. But, of course, the more you weaponize the U.S. dollar, the more you lose your friends. And I think that's, that's the challenge today, of course, is, you know, I can sit here and say, look, the U.S. dollar has all these problems, and you and I can, can agree on this all day. And then you look elsewhere, and you find lots of problems as well. And I think all this, at the end of the day, adds uh, uncertainty and volatility to the investment environment. My own belief is that China increasingly is becoming more and more successful at transforming the renminbi into a trade currency and into Asia's reserve currency, and then basically telling all of its neighbors, look, let's use the renminbi as our sort of regional currency and shelter ourselves from the volatility that comes from using the U.S. dollar and increasingly the political interference that comes from using the U.S. dollar. Louis, unfortunately, we don't have time for all of your slides today, but let's jump ahead to page 45, because as we talk about the renminbi, China's currency, the old story that we've heard from so many people in finance is, look, that, that is the weakest currency on the planet. The thing's going to crash. You better look out. The sky is falling. As you show on this chart, that's not the way it's been playing out. So why is it that so many smart people, Kyle Bass and, and so many others, thought, okay, the yuan is going to crash here? It didn't. Why didn't it? And is it going to? And, and if not, why is it still looking like a good currency? Look, I've liked the renminbi for the past 10 years because I think the Chinese leadership tends to say what it does and does what it says. And you know, for the past 10 years, the speech has been, look, we want to move – our trade from being U.S. dollar denominated to being renminbi denominated. We want to internationalize the currency. That's why we're opening the bond market to foreigners. That's why we're opening uh, our currency to foreigners. And of course, if you want to be a reserve currency and a trade currency, you can't be a weak currency. Nobody wants to save in Greek drachmas. Nobody keeps their companies working capital in Italian liras. You know, people save in Deutschmarks. People save in Swiss francs because those are strong and stable currencies. And if China's goal was really to become the Deutsche Mark of Asia, then it had to be a strong currency, and it has been. Uh, indeed, the charts on page 45 highlights that the compounded returns of keeping cash in renminbi has beaten the pants out of pretty much any other major currency out there, whether the euro, the pound, the yen. Compounding has been better in renminbi than, than in, anybody else, in any other currency. So indeed, if you are keeping your working capital, you know, if you're an Indonesian company keeping some working capital in renminbi, was a much more profitable decision than keeping it in, in other currencies. And I think perhaps that's the, the part that uh, foreigners have missed, is that when they look at China, they look at the picture of where it is today, and they see you know, the excess debt, the, the real estate 
uh, expansion, the, the bad banks, etc. All the negative picture. They see what China is today. I think they they fail to see what China is going to be in five or ten years time. And the reality today, of course, is that nobody out there owns the renminbi apart from China and apart from Chinese people. Nobody, you know, for all the talk about the Chinese debt, no foreigners own Chinese debt, or not in any meaningful sense. Thus, if China is mildly successful in internationalizing the renminbi, that means that all the foreigners have to start buying. And who's going to be selling on the other side, given that China doesn't really run current account uh, deficits? It, it did last quarter, but now with commodities falling, it's probably going to be back to a surplus pretty soon. So there is no natural seller of the renminbi, and there's a lot of people who will need to start using the renminbi more. And I think it's the supply-demand imbalance that makes that's made the renminbi not the, the slam-dunk trade that so many hedge fund managers thought it would be. Now, Louis, you're going to be joining us for Macro Voices Live out in January. Can you share with our listeners what you had in mind to do in, in your presentation? Well, you know, our former British Prime Minister Callaghan once said uh, a week is an eternity in politics. I think it's an eternity in mar- a week, let alone a month, is an eternity in markets. So who knows what the world would look like in a month's time. Having said that, I think what I would like to talk about is the growing, the changing world that we live in and the the outlook for the U.S. dollar in this growing, changing world. Because the simple reality is the coming year will most likely be driven by what happens to the dollar. If If the dollar goes down, you probably can't own enough emerging markets, given how cheap they are today. If the U.S. dollar goes up another leg, the question will be, will it impact U.S. growth? And if the U.S. dollar goes up another leg, what impact for financial markets? I tend to believe the U.S. markets will go down next year. I'll explain why, and I'll explain the consequences for, uh, for asset allocation. Louis, I can't thank you enough for a fantastic interview. I just want to encourage our listeners. We didn't have time for the whole slide deck, but you should make time. Definitely, you're going to want to download this deck. Louis, I notice at the end of the deck, your email address is there. Is it okay for our listeners to contact you there? Oh, absolutely. If uh, I'm always looking forward to questions. Uh, of course, that's how we learn. I personally always say that uh, 90% of the ideas we get are from our, our clients. The other 10% that I get do myself are usually the stupid ones. So, no, I, like, I, I'm always happy to answer any, any kind of questions. And, of course, I'm hoping uh, otherwise to, to meet your listeners in, in Vancouver. And I think that uh, there's also a ski day after the conference, right? I'll be skiing with whoever skis well. Uh, I'll be taking up Whistler. Is that right? Yeah, I know that Julian Brigden was a little intimidated. You said expert skiers only. You know, he's from Vail, and you got Vail versus... Uh... Vale versus Whistler. So I'm staying out of the middle of that one, but uh, I'll leave it to you guys. But yeah, there is uh, definitely a lot of people that are attending the conference are bringing their boards with them, and we'll be going up to Whistler after the conference. Well, you know, the Vale Whistler thing is uh, it's a very sore point because Vale bought Whistler uh, a couple of years ago and started to, to change a few things, which ruffled all the, uh, the old timers and the, the locals here in Whistler. So the, uh, the Vale Whistler rivalry is a strong one. Okay, well, I'm staying out of the middle of that one, but we look forward to seeing both you and Julian, both our good friends in the macro community, and we'll let you guys duke it out on the slopes. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much. Well, Louis, we'll uh, see you out in Vancouver. Looking forward to it. Looking forward to it. Take care. Thanks a bunch. Folks, you've heard it before, but you'll hear it again. We need your help promoting Macro Voices. We also really appreciate your donations this holiday season. So please do everything you can to tell your friends and colleagues about Macro Voices. Forward your research roundup emails. Most importantly, register your free account at macrovoices.com. The benefit is you'll receive our free research roundup email, which never contains advertising or marketing. It's just links to all of the best free stuff that we could find on the Internet each week. Patrick, tell them what's in this week's research roundup. Our listeners are going to find uh, the transcript for today's interview, as well as a link to the chart book that Professor Altman shared with us throughout the presentation. You'll also find the link to Louis Vincent Gav's chart book that we just discussed here in the post game. You'll also find a link to a great interview that Paul Tudor Jones had on CNBC, where uh, they covered all sorts of really interesting topics. It was some, it's a must listen. So you'll find this and so much more in this week's research roundup. That does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support. 
support we get from our listeners, and we're always looking for suggestions on how we can make the program even better. Now, for those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com or tag it with the MVRR hashtag on Twitter, and we'll include it in our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account, at Macro Voices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter, at Eric S. Townsend, and myself, at Patrick Serezna. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening, and we'll see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly Research Roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at MacroVoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com. <laughs>